Hi, my name is Debbie Kravitsky. I'm a registered clinical dietitian at Mass General Hospital's Cardiovascular Disease Prevention Center. I'm here to talk to you about the impact that fat has on your arterial health. Many times after a heart event, people will often tell me that the first thing they did was they cut all, all the fat from their diet. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not at all what I want you to do. You need to include fat in your diet because we need fat for thermal insulation and protection to protect your organs, to absorb fat-soluble vitamins, namely vitamins A, D, E, and K. I don't know about you, but fat certainly makes my food taste better, and they help us to stay feeling full longer. So I want you to make sure to include fat, but I want you to be mindful that fats do provide you with nine calories per gram. That's more than twice as many calories per gram as you'll get from carbohydrates and protein. So if you're watching your weight, definitely be mindful of portion size when it comes to fat. It also is important for you to be mindful of the amount of fat so that you can have a balanced diet. But what's most important is that you include the right type of fat for its effect on cholesterol. So to do all of that, we first have to know where in our diet, which foods are providing us with sources of fat. So I want you to think butter and margarines, nuts and seeds, nut butters like peanut butter and almond butter, all oils are fats. In, um, ghee is fat if you're cooking, if you're doing Indian cooking. It would also be anything with the word cream, sweet cream, sour cream, whipped cream, ice cream, cream cheese, half and half. These are all sources of fat. And think of foods that have a lot of fat in them, such as gravy and, um, and salad dressings and mayonnaise. These are all sources of fat. Now, it's important to include fat, but it, to choose selectively the ones that will be the most uh, appropriate type for its impact on your cholesterol level. The first type of fat I want to talk about are fats that I want you to limit. In terms of cholesterol, it's not that cholesterol is not important. It's this, that you won't eat enough dietary cholesterol unless you have a genetic issue to really make a difference. But what I do want you to look at is your intake of red meat. Red meat is a grouping, so I want you to think about your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner. How often are you including red meat? And it is a grouping, as I said, so it includes pork. Pork is not the other white meat. Good marketing, just not true. So if you're including pork, are you having hot dogs, bacon, sausage, and ham, also lamb and veal, steak, hamburger, and roast beef? It's a huge group. I want you to limit red meat no more than once a week. Twice a week is that rare on occasion max because as red meat intake goes up, obesity also will go up. Diabetes goes up, heart disease, stroke, certain cancers, most notably colorectal and probably stomach cancer as well. So if you're including a lot of red meat, here would be your first step to make a change. I'd like you to dial it all the way back you do not need to include any, but if you are, limit it to no more than once a week. Twice is that rare occasion. And if you are going to include red meat, make sure it's lean and low in sodium. So remember the words loin and round. It's a sirloin steak. It's a tenderloin steak. It's a filet flank steak, top or bottom round, but not prime rib nor ribeye. They're just too fatty a cut. If you're going to include hamburger, make sure it's 93 to 99% lean. If you buy, by the way, on a side note, if you buy ground chicken or ground turkey in a market, it can include skin, tendons, who knows what. It has to say ground chicken, ground turkey, 93 to 99% lean, keeping in mind that poultry is not included in this group called red meat. So we dial the red meat all the way back. That's your first change, and go you. You're on your way to being healthier. Because cholesterol is a fat, it's a waxy substance, it can't travel in the blood, which is basically liquid. Excuse me, water and oil, they don't jive. So when you eat fats, they'll get broken down in your stomach and sent to the liver. And in the liver, this fat will get packaged or bundled with a protein. The unit, it's called a lipo, protein. Lipid is fat, protein, protein. And as a lipoprotein, now it can travel through the blood doing what it needs to. One kind of lipoprotein is called the LDL, the low density lipoprotein. People remember this L for lousy or low. 
This is the kind of cholesterol that gets deposited along your arterial walls. So when you have an elevated LDL cholesterol, you have a lot of plaque, you're at high risk for heart disease. Because this LDL is a predictor for a future coronary event, we always keep an eye on the LDL, and people remember the L for low. For this one, this number you want low. Where there's a villain, there's a hero, the HDL. People remember this high-density lipoprotein, the H for highway, healthy, hooray. It will come along, try to unstick whatever LDL it can take with it along its path. It will take it back to your liver so it can get reprocessed or excreted. When you have a high HDL, it's thought you have a lot of clearing, lower risk for heart disease. HDL is interesting in that it, while it has a protective role in the heart, it's unclear its role in being a predictor for a future coronary event. For that, stay with the L for lousy, the LDL. Also, any extreme of HDL is thought to be a risk. If it's too low, which is the case for many, it's not there to do the job of clearing. If it's very high, it's thought to be a genetic issue, which is also thought to be a risk factor. But luckily, exercise, food choices, medications can manipulate these numbers to get you where you want to go. When you exercise, it's like taking a dose of medicine, and HDL goes up. So just like the Nike slogan, you just do it. If you have weight to lose, HDL will go up. So move it and lose it and watch the HDL go up. Here's the interesting part. Ready? All fats, whether you have cream or nuts or sour cream or a healthy oil, all fats raise HDL. The trick is some of these fats in this pot are making your L for lousy, the LDL go up, and those we've got to take out of the mix. Those fats that we need to take out of the mix because they're raising your L for lousy, the LDL, those fats are called saturated fats. Saturated fats are generally solid at room temperature, generally of animal origin. And when you eat saturated fats over time, they do a few things eat them over time, they raise LDL. So eat them over time, get plaque. Another thing that saturated fats will do is right then and there upon digestion, they cause your arterial walls to stiffen. That's going to put more pressure in your heart to pump through a stiffer opening. That's going to increase your risk for heart disease. So these saturated fats, we really dial them down. If you've ever seen white fat congeal around leftovers in your fridge and you knew that didn't look good, that's saturated fat. So we get saturated fats for meats. It's another reason for you to dial down your intake of red meat. We get saturated fats from dairy. We get them from the tropical oils, coconut oil and palm oil. And in Indian cooking, we get them from ghee. So let's go through each one of them. For meats, we said lean, loin and, and round, as well as low sodium. Think about if you're having any of these. I just want to ask, are you having any hot dogs? Are you having any bacon? Are you having sausage and cold cuts? Now, turkey, chicken, roast beef, fine. I mean salami, pastrami, corned beef, rolled beef, bologna, all the Italian cold cuts. These four, hot dogs, the bacon, the sausage, the cold cuts, they're what I call triple threats. My son is a sports broadcaster. When I say triple threat, he gets all excited. I'm not saying triple threat, however, in a good way. So here's triple threat number one. These foods, hot dog, bacon, sausage, and cold cuts, they're high in saturated fat. Triple threat number two, they're high in salt. Salt acts like a sponge. It's going to hold your fluid, make your heart have to work that much harder. So an increased intake in salt is linked to an increased risk of stroke. It's also linked to early mortality as an independent risk factor, which means it doesn't matter how old you are. This includes kids, everybody. Could care less what your weight is. Exercise or not, it doesn't matter. It's an independent risk factor. To give you an idea of how potent salt is, it's thought that if as a country we eat so much processed food, if we could cut our intake of salt in half just by doing that, we'd save about 100,000 lives every year. So why aren't we? Not so easy. Your taste for salt regulates. So the more you have it, the more you're going to want it. But the less you have it, the less you're going to want it. You're going to know a food is high in salt by the acronym SKIP with a C instead of a K. So S, C, I, and P. The S is for smoked. Salmon is great, but smoked salmon is not. Almonds, fabulous, but not smoked almonds. Turkey, but not smoked turkey. The C is for cured. 
pickles, except for bread and butter pickles, which are fine. There's also a company called Grillo, G-R-I-L-L-O, and they're, both their dill and their bread and butter pickles are low in sodium. It would be um, black olives are fine, but green are soaked in a brine. Green olives are too high in salt. Don't confuse black and Kalamata olives. They look very similar, but Kalamata olives are high in salt. It would be no Chinese food unless steamed, no soy sauce. Even low sodium soy sauce is too high. The I is for instant. In an instant rice mix, it's in the flavor packet. So boiling back brown rice is great, but a pilaf is too high in salt. Instant mashed potato, instant pasta mixes are often too high in salt. The P is processed. TV dinners, boiling bag meals, lean cuisines, canned soups, canned vegetables are all tend to be high in salt. To get back to the saturated fats, these are dairy fats. The number one source of saturated fat in our country comes from mixed dishes, predominantly because of cheese. So your mantra here is read it before you eat it. Always check the label. The number you're looking for is two. It should be no, have no more than two grams of saturated fat in a serving. Some light cheeses will have three. Three grams is too much. So I love these Baby Bell cheeses. They come in a fishnet bag, as you can see. Just make sure it says light. The regular and light looks identical. This is a thick round, so oftentimes I will peel it, turn it on its side, cut it into thinner slices so that it'll, be, have, it'll melt more evenly, and you can put it inside a whole wheat pocket for a grilled cheese sandwich. You also can put it on top of whole wheat pizza dough. It makes delicious pizza. It's also good as a snack all by itself. I also am a fan of the baby, of the laughing cow cheese. This comes in many flavors. For anybody who knows me knows that I love garlic. This is their garlic and cheese. My husband likes a spicy pepper jack. There are many, many flavors to choose from, including Swiss, uh, mozzarella, you get to choose, uh, Asiago. And it's a great way to include cheese that's heart healthy and won't clog your arteries. For dairy fats, it's anything with the word cream. Sweet cream, sour cream, whipped cream, ice cream, cream cheese, half and half. For this grouping, you'll have to go fat free. Light won't be light enough, except for the aerosol whipped cream. That totally fits the bill. Isn't that a nice treat? And also there are many on the market, low fat ice creams that you can choose from. Again, your mantra is read it before you eat it. You're always looking for no more than two grams of saturated fat in a serving. That will help you to stay within your daily allotment of about five to 6% of your calories if you have heart disease should come from sat no more should come from saturated fat. This is dairy fat, so it's butter is a saturated fat. It's not better with butter. It's better with a spread such as take control by promise or I can't believe it's not butter. Country crock, they're all good choices. If you want to save the calories from butter, you can use these sprays like like I can't believe it's not butter, makes a spray. They also make a spread. The spread is great, but it has calories. This is less than a calorie of spray, tastes exactly like butter. And Olivio also makes a butter spray that it's a great way to enjoy the flavor without having to pay for it for calories. So these are great choices that you can turn to if you're looking to cut calories and not pay for them so dearly as these fat calories do add up. It would be whole milk is not all fat, but it's three and a half percent fat. All that fat is saturated, so no more than one percent milk. If you're if you're used to drinking two percent or whole, you might try Simply Smart by Hood or Over the Moon by Gorelick. There, these two companies took the water out of their milk, becomes thicker. So if I blindfold you and gave you their skim milk, you'd say, I think I'm drinking one or two percent. And if I gave you their one percent, you'd say, Deb, that's either two percent or whole. So you don't need to sacrifice taste, but you don't need to clog your arteries either. The single most inf influential fat that you can include to lower your L for lousy, your LDL, are called polyunsaturated fats. So make sure in your diet you include some of these. Corn oil, safflower oil, such as right here. Here is a great example of safflower oil. It would be sunflower oil, and these can be in the form of sunflower oil or sunflower seeds, or there's something called sun butter. So sun butter is sort of like a peanut butter. It will um, taste just a little different because it's made from sunflower oil, and you'll see that it is very similar to peanut butter, as you can see right here. 
and it'll be more effective in lowering your L for lousy, the LDL cholesterol. So you may want to try sun butter available in all markets. It would be grapeseed oil. So make sure you include corn, safflower, sunflower, um, and grapeseed oil. These are the most effective in lowering the LDL cholesterol. A subset of these are the omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s do many things. They reduce inflammation throughout the body. That's a risk factor consistent with heart disease. They also lower a kind of fat that contributes to plaque called triglycerides. Triglycerides similar to LDL in the fact that they are also a predictor for a future coronary event. We always keep an eye on triglycerides. Triglycerides rise in response to alcohol. So if your triglycerides are high, take a look and see if you're including alcohol. Also, it, they rise in response to the refined carbohydrate, foods that behave like sugar. So sugar itself, as well as any cookies or candy, regular soda, juice, and the white bread, white rice, white pasta, these will all raise triglycerides. The omega-3s will lower those triglycerides like a charm. So your first step is to make the dietary change by either eliminating or cutting back on alcohol to substitute the refined carbohydrates for carbohydrates that are high in fiber or whole grain, and then to include fish, because the best source of the omega-3s are cold water fish. Tell me if you like any of these. Do you like salmon or herring, sardines, mackerel, tuna, and trout? Now, all fish have omega-3s. It's just highest in these. Anything good for your heart is good for your brain. This is truly brain food. So you want to include fish at least twice a week, preferably even four. If you're listening to this video thinking, no way, that will never happen, then there is no harm in including a fish oil supplement. The goal of a supplement is to fill in the missing pieces that your diet is, is lacking. So some of my favorite supplements, when you buy a fish oil supplement, you always want to add the EPA and DHA. So don't go by the front of the package. The front of a fish oil supplement will include all kinds of omega-3s. There's an omega-3 that comes from plants. It's called ALA. Remember, A away. It doesn't do any of the things I just said omega-3s from fish do. It actually has to be converted into the form that's in fish in order to be utilized by the body. This process of conversion is not very efficient, which means you're only going to get a smidge. Good news is you only need a smidge. And these include canola oil, walnuts, pecans, flaxseed. So if you cook with a little canola oil, you got it. You eat about six walnuts, you got it. So when you buy a supplement, you're looking for what you didn't get in your diet. And that, in this case, would be the oil from fish. So don't go by the front. Turn your package over. Look at the nutrition panel. Add the EPA and DHA. They should equal 1,000 milligrams. Then scroll at the top and look at the dosage. You might see two brands, one next to each other. And one looks like it's less expensive than the brand next to it. But actually, it takes two pills to get there, making it more expensive. So make sure you check the dosage. Also check the expiration date. You never want to burp a fish oil supplement up. It probably means that oil has gone rancid, so toss it. So my recommendation is to store fish oil in the freezer so it will hold longer and take it with food. Good examples of some fish oil supplements, if you're not a fish eater, would be, this is by um, Nordic Naturals. It's called their Ultimate Omega-2 Times, and it will give you what you need. This one is by Vital Oils 1000. You order this online, it will come right to your door. One pill will do it. This has very interesting packaging in that um, if you can take a look, you'll see that when you zoom in, that when, if you, as long as you take the, you know what day it is and you know you took it, then this is marked by day and you will be in good shape. But one pill will do it. If you take a look here, if you can zoom in, you will see that if you add the EPA and DHA, you'll see you'll get to that thousand and um, one pill will, will, the dose was one pill. For those of you who don't like to swallow pills, because they are good size, this is by Carlson, it's their fish oil, and another one by Carlson is their Super Omega-3, and you'll see that when you add the two together, the EPA and DHA, they will definitely give you at least the 1,000 milligrams. 
people think if it's good, should I have more? Well, these oils, the omega-3s, thin your blood, so more is not better. It's all dependent upon your triglycerides as to how much um, omega-3 that you might need if you need more of a therapeutic dose to help you to lower it. Best is always to get it from food, so I encourage you first to turn to food uh, to include fish at least twice a week. Shellfish is fine, but just know that there's hardly any omega-3s in shellfish, so include shellfish if you like it, but not part of this twice a week fish count. Monounsaturated fats are good for improving the function of the lining of the arteries. They're good for diabetes prevention. You'll find monounsaturated fats in foods such as olives, olive oil, also in avocados, in peanuts, peanut butter, and also almonds, almond butter. Now, as fats are a concentrated source of calories, there are some ways that you can include them while cutting the calories and getting more for less. So here is a great example of that. This is called PB2. It's an example of one of the many powdered peanut butters out there. When you, if you, I was to ask you, how long does it take you to eat 10 peanuts? It's pop. That's 100 calories. That's how fast these fat calories will add up. And if a little bit of peanut gives you a lot of calories, then a little bit of peanut butter would also give you a lot of calories. So this company called PB2, they took those peanuts, they ground them down to a powder, and then they extracted a third of the fat. When you open up the jar, you're going to see this. And you say, what the heck is that? Well, this is the powder that they ground those peanuts down to. Now let me show you what will happen. You take out what you want, and we're doing this live. That's usually when anything can happen, but here we go. Take out what you want and add a little bit of water. If it's too thick, you'll add more water. If it's too thin, you'll add more powder. And you stir it. And what you're going to see is that this will reconstitute. And look at that. Now you have peanut butter. And you can make it as thick or as loose as you like it. The trick is, instead of 190 calories for peanut butter, you now went down to 60. So you got peanut butter, tastes the exact same it is. It's just the nuts that they ground down to a powder, but they took out a third of the fat and it tastes the same. So it's a great way to include peanut butter, but not have to pay for it for calories. So include fat in your diet. Just make sure you include the right type of fat for its effect on cholesterol. Thank you.